Well, hi guys and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to part two of Sleeping Warrior, Fighting Reality, One Misapplied Definition at a Time. Now remember, this is our subscription drive month, so have a look for our logo here down in the lower right corner, click on that, and subscribe to my channel. Let's get started. Now today we're going to go over Newton's laws of motion, gravity, and why the atmosphere doesn't disappear into space. Isaac Newton's laws of motion are claimed to be laws. They apply always. Newton's got three laws of motion, and one of them, everybody knows that an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by a force. Hey Anthony, you know you're absolutely right. The first law does say that objects at rest remain at rest, and objects in motion remain in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. You notice he's got a second law there, too, that says force equals mass times acceleration. That's why density is not a force. There's no acceleration. Now, buoyancy is a force because you have the acceleration of gravity, but not density. But everybody, not everybody remembers the second part to it, which is that an object in a state of motion will remain in that state of motion unless acted upon by an external force. Yeah, Anthony, we actually do know about that. That's how satellites stay in orbit. You're moving in a straight line, and gravity pulls you down so that you fall around the Earth. That's the way satellites orbit. If the atmosphere is under pressure and it's pressing up against something, which in our case is the vacuum of space at 10 to the minus 17 tor, then there needs to be a force to stop it from bursting into the atmosphere, bursting into the vacuum of space, because it requires a force according to Newton's laws. If you then type in gas pressure, you'll find that you get a generic pressure definition, which is the force exerted by the substance per unit area on another substance, and then you get the pressure of a gas is the force that the gas exerts on the walls of its container. So we know that you need a container to have gas pressure. That's why Nathan's got housekeeping. We know that you have to have containment to have gas pressure. Well, Anthony, here is where your definition breaks down. You've got a very generic definition of what gas pressure is, but there's a very specific definition for what atmospheric pressure is. Atmospheric pressure is caused by the gravitational attraction of a planet on the atmospheric gases above the surface. So, atmospheric pressure in this room, which is on my body, is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That is caused by the mass of the air above me and the downward acceleration of the force of gravity. I guess that's pretty much your entire argument, isn't it? Sure. NASA, and you can, you can find this just by doing a rudimentary search on, on Google, tell you that air pressure is pressure force acts perpendicular to enclosing surfaces. Well, we do have gas pressure, and we know that it's pushing down on us because apparently we can feel it. Shouts to uh, Matt Doxy. But we can feel the gas pressure, apparently, but it's pressing on all sides, not just on the Earth. It's pressing in all, in all directions. But as Nathan correctly points out, what's it pressing on at the top? You know, Anthony, just because it amuses me to kick you when you're down, I think I'm going to do it again. This is the basic working model of a barometer. You see that thing that's a sealed tube? That has a vacuum above the mercury. Now, atmospheric pressure imparts a force on that mercury to push it up against the weight of gravity. But it only goes so far. But Anthony, there's atmospheric pressure on the pool of mercury. There's atmospheric pressure pushing this mercury up in the tube. There's a vacuum on the top of the tube. Why does it go all the way to the top, Anthony? What's holding it back? You think maybe that's what's holding the atmosphere back too? What's that word? Oh yeah, gravity. Because there isn't any resistance. There is a vacuum which is 
I'm going to say the word sucking. Yeah, I know you're all going to shout at me for saying sucking. Vacuums don't suck. But that pressure is trying to explode into the vacuum of a space. And we know when the helium balloon bursts, we know that it does it instantaneously. It's like immediate. I'm going to call it an explosion. So we know that this is what happens. And NASA tell us that the, the pressure inside the balloon acts perpendicular to all enclosing surfaces. So imagine that this balloon is the Earth. We know that, according to NASA, that the gas pressure exerts itself perpendicular to all enclosing surfaces. When there's a balloon there, this makes perfect sense. But when there's not a balloon there, we haven't got anything stopping the pressure of atmosphere pressing against something because there isn't a balloon encapsulating the Earth on their model. You know, Anthony, there's not a balloon encapsulating the top of that mercury column either, and it's in direct contact with a vacuum. Go figure. And oh, by the way, I know you love saying NASA says, but that's an appeal to authority. Simply because NASA says something or Neil deGrasse Tyson says something, you have to actually understand what they're talking about in order for what they say to make sense. This isn't one of those cases, Anthony, because you don't. I'm not being pedantic when I ask what's stopping the atmosphere from bursting into space. Because at least if we've got a balloon, there's a membrane of some kind. Whether it's adequate or not isn't the point, but there's at least something to stop it. There's something that's bouncing the gas pressure back down to Earth. But if there's no balloon protecting the Earth or the atmosphere of Earth, we have a problem. It's a legitimate question. From a flat Earth perspective, it's bloody obvious. But from a ball Earth perspective, well, they need a force. NASA tells us that the force must be exerted on the insides of all its surfaces. We have gas pressure pushing out in all directions, but we haven't got a membrane. You know, Anthony, I have a question for you. I like your little diagram. That's cute. And I see that you have like a little box that's got four sides on it. And you're real worried about what's holding the gas down that presses on the top of that little box. Because we know it holds it down on the bottom, and that would be the ground. What holds it on the left and right side? Are there like walls every few miles on Earth? Why don't you think about that for a few minutes? If Newton's laws are true, an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. That's his, one of his laws. They do need a force. Albert Einstein, according to Wikipedia, gravity is most accurately described by the general theory of relativity proposed by Albert Einstein in 1915, which describes gravity not as a force, which is a problem because they need something to stop the atmosphere bursting into space instantaneously, but as a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the uneven distribution of mass. Now here's the problem that you run into when you try and cite scientific references. Quantum Eraser tried this the other day. He had six or eight scientific references that said, Gravity is not a force. And that's fine. They did say that. And then they went right down a couple of paragraphs below it to go on and say that as long as the object is not extremely massive, extremely small, or moving close to the speed of light, Einstein's gravity reverts to Newton. Now, I'm going to say that one more time. Unless you are dealing with extreme cases, Einsteinian gravity reverts to Newtonian gravity, and you can use Newtonian gravity in its place with no fear of error. And if you would like to see the references for that, I'll put a link to the video where I took apart quantum erasers arguments in the description of this video. That does not explain what's stopping the atmosphere from bursting into space. Fact. Whatever bendy space-time may or may not do, it seems to be addressing the orbits of the planets around the sun. It adds nothing to the explanation for why the atmosphere does not burst into space. Now let me get this straight, Anthony. You just admitted that the planets orbit around the sun, and you just admitted that Einstein's gravity seems to affect those orbits. 
yet you cannot make the connection as to how that would have bearing on the atmosphere? Have you ever read Einstein's theory of relativity? Do you have any idea what he's talking about other than the fact you cherry-picked a keyword search that said gravity is not a force and you found it in, in this article? Anthony, you have to read the article and understand the article in order to use the article. This is a legitimate question that flat earthers are asking, and all flat earthers need to keep asking it. Because we want the science that demonstrates what's stopping the atmosphere from filling the available volume immediately of the atmosphere. Ball earthers need to come up with the science that demonstrates this to be true. Whatever atmosphere may exist, demonstrate that it can it can repel or it can it can counter the um, pressure disequilibrium of ten to the minus seventeen tor against five, ten, two, six, one. PSI, show that something can do that without a membrane. Of course you can't. You know, Anthony, sometimes a graphic can help people understand things that words just kind of don't get through to. This is a graph of the pressure of the atmosphere versus the height. If you look down in the lower right corner, that's the number of millibars. Um, atmospheric pressure on the surface is about a thousand millibars. Now, if you notice that that curve goes quickly to zero. And when you get to about 15 miles or about 30 kilometers, most of the atmosphere is below that point and the pressure is almost gone. By the time you get to 50 kilometers, only one-tenth of a percent of the atmospheric pressure at the surface is still present. And when you get up to 90 kilometers, one ten-thousandth of a percent of the pressure remains. Where does the vacuum of space start, Anthony? Oh, and let me give you a little bit of advice. Ballers, as you call people that believe in reality, don't need to explain this to flat earthers. We have explained it to you. What you need to do is to start listening to those explanations and trying to understand the science behind them so they make sense to you. What do they come back and say? Pressure gradients. It doesn't do it instantly. Well, you can't have a pressure gradient because it's done instantaneously. The balloon burst instantaneously. The balloon did not burst with a pressure gradient. The balloon burst instantaneously. Now, you remember I told you that he was not at all concerned with what was going on in that vacuum chamber? His only concern was the use of the word instantaneously. And I told you that he was going to try and use it later, and here it is. He is maintaining that there is an analogy between a small vacuum chamber and 100 kilometers of atmosphere. And somehow the vacuum of space at 10 to the negative 17th tor, does he even know what a tor is? Suddenly suck all of the gas off the surface of the earth unless there is an intervening membrane of some sort. That's not true. It's not even remotely true. We've shown it with the mercury barometer. We've shown it with differences in pressure with elevation and mountains. I've shown you the graph of the pressure based on kilometers above the surface. His argument is simply dismissed as irrelevant and unfounded. The word is instantaneously. We want to see citation that demonstrates that gas pressure can exist next to a vacuum without instantaneously filling the volume and that's what we know that happens it can be demonstrated we can we know we can demonstrate it because the balloon burst instantaneously it didn't slow burst it didn't gradually density gradient burst it burst instantly this debunks the idea that you can have gas pressure next to a, a vacuum without containment you know this is what you get when you think for some reason you're a lawyer and you can make a legal argument without having any knowledge of the subject in which you are arguing about. I told you that he was going to try and play up this instantaneously thing. He was going to misapply it to the situation of the atmosphere, and he was going to completely ignore the fact that there is indeed a force acting upon the atmosphere, holding it to the ground. We've given examples of different pressures uh, at sea level, at mountaintops, and well above the surface of the Earth. We've shown that there's a pressure gradient. Blue Marble Science did an excellent demonstration of establishing a pressure gradient using butane in an open top tube. Open. I think we're going to go ahead and go with one more episode on this because I think he's got a little bit more. And then we're going to try and finish up and show 
what the basis of these arguments are. I'll give you a little advance notice of that. It's one thing to understand the definition of words. It's another thing to understand how those words are used and how they are put into action. That is the problem in the Flat Earth. Do me a favor, hit that little like and subscribe button down there, hit a sub to my channel. We are having a big push for subscribers this month, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd help out with that. Be that one in five people that isn't currently subscribed, but decides to subscribe now. So, signing out from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. We'll see you again soon.